Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stories of Light. I am your host, Elizabeth Dylan Berkovici, and I'm so excited to be here today with Wynn Thierry, um, who's going to be talking about the mysteries of Avalon. Uh, so, Wynn, hello, welcome here. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you um, so much for inviting me. Oh, yes, yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, so for anyone who is not familiar with Wynn, let me give you a little bit of information. So Wynn Thierry is a flower essence producer and therapist, as well as the author of Alchemy Healing um, and Ancestral Alchemy Healing. Wynn is an energy worker and spiritual teacher and a holder of ancient wisdom. Um, in the last two years, Wynn has discovered her true spiritual home in Glastonbury. She's found her grail and its essence. It's opened itself to her, welcomed her, and invited her to help it restore its former glory. So I just, I'm just so excited because it seems like you have had many, many years of deepening, um, you know, with the mysteries, uh, really studying a lot of different modalities. And now like spirit has brought you home to Avalon, you know, so I'm just really, really excited to dive deeply into the mysteries today. Yes, it's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, it's very exciting because I know that you've had a journey. I know that, you know, you spent, you know, you told me like, you know, most of the early part of your life in Ireland, then you were in Australia and it seems like spirit took you a while, you know, before you actually got to go to Glastonbury. So it really feels like, you know, Avalon like called you home. And I, I think that's so beautiful because I feel like, you know, Avalon calls a lot of souls home, even if they don't get to like live there. I just feel like the lore and fascination with this place, it's its around the globe. Everyone seems to be drawn to the magic of this place. I know, Elizabeth. It took me a long time to get there, you know, and I've been waiting and waiting and then it happened and now you can't keep me away. <laughs> I, I would live that. there if I could. If I win the lotto, I'd be there every day. <laughs> Um, so actually, so this is like perfect for my first question. So my first question is, you know, can you talk about your personal relationship with the land of Avalon? Um, I'm just so excited uh, for you to share this with everyone. Oh, yes. Um, well, I don't know where to start, Elizabeth. When I first went to Glastonbury, I, you know, went exploring because it's such an amazing place to find your way around. And I went to the Abbey. And when I went to the Abbey, I couldn't stay on the grounds of the Abbey. Everyone goes to the Abbey, you know, it's the ancient Abbey. And I had to leave. And then I went back in, yeah, that, that's right. When I went there, what I could feel was, I could feel the conflict between Henry VIII and the Pope mm. and between the army and the priests because the abbey was demolished with the um, dissolution of the monasteries way back in the 1500s. So that was fine. I went back again in April and I just couldn't go to the abbey. I just, I just couldn't go there. I enjoyed everything else, but I couldn't go to the abbey. And then on the Sunday, the day before I left, I started crying and I couldn't stop crying. And I cried all day Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday until lunchtime Thursday. And I rang Caroline, the lady that I, whose apartment I rent. And I said, Caroline, have you any vacancies for September? And she gave me the dates and I took them and I canceled a holiday in Scotland that I was gonna go on. And the tears stopped and that was it. And I arrived in September and I was there for the harvest full moon, Elizabeth. And I didn't realize that. And because that's a really powerful time for me. So I arrived, I had a girlfriend come to stay with me and she left. And on the Thursday, the queen died. Mm, yes, like, seems like you, yes. were, you were meant to be there at that yes. time. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and, and during the week I had already made two essences. I had made the grace essence and the Mary Magdalene essence. And until um, so the queen died, I couldn't stop crying. I was really unconsolable. And um, the guy in the bookshop said to me, you know, when she was the high priestess, you know, she was the high priestess. And I could feel that. I could feel it in my bones. And then on the Friday, I got this message, you know, you are to go back to the chalice well. You're to go back to the chalice well and make a queen essence in honor of the queen and to develop the queen archetype within us. Mm, I love so... <laughs> 
off I went with my carrier and, and I got told, bring another essence carrier with you. But I wasn't told what that was. And so I went and I found this beautiful peachy rose growing right by the chalice well. And when I'd finished and I just turned around the corner in this little recess was this mother standing with her arms outstretched and a child standing on her knee. Mm. And there was acorn offerings being made to her. And I looked up and I was standing under an oak tree. The great symbol of the Celts and the Druids. Mm, I love that. And so in came the message. This essence is to be called King Arthur, the courage essence. I love this. I love this so much. <laughs> oh my and God. so, of course, Charles is Charles Philip Arthur George. And I got told, this is the return of King Arthur. And this king will bring people together. And he'll bring kings and governments together. And he'll create peace. And he will protect the land. I think it's amazing. We're seeing the way that the kingship was distorted. Yes. And like, this is the rightful way of kingship. This yes. is the way that a king is truly supposed to show up and lead the people and protect the land. So it's like amazing that like, I feel like especially England itself has gone on such a journey, not really having that leadership that was in full integrity. Um, because really, I feel like, especially with the king, it is a marriage with the land. That was yes. the original divine rights of kingship. It was that marriage with the yes. land. Yes, yes. So anyway, I made this essence. And, and she said to me, you know, to the word I give my son, the high priestess to say, and on it goes. And it's just the most beautiful essence. And then when I finished, I got this message. You are to take these back to your apartment now. These are the most precious essence you've created. You're to have a sleep. And then you're to climb the tower in the moonlight. And of course, I'm hopeless. hopeless. I'm really unfit. Climb the tour. 310 steps. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I knew, Elizabeth, I knew I had to. I knew I just had to. And I climbed up and people were going up and down. And there was this amazing moon over on my right-hand side. And uh, I got to the top and I got down again. And I came back to the apartment and I was wrecked. And I went to bed. And the next morning, I got this message. You are not who you were yesterday. You are not who you were yesterday. You're to rest up today. The job is done now. The job is done. And you're going home tomorrow. And that was fine, you know. I just, the enormity of what I've done. And I'd been asked to appear at Amos Stassen's Summit in the same when it was there. And, you know, I, whenever I go there, I connect to all the different levels of energies. And, so anyway, that was fine. That was fine until Monday last week. Elizabeth, Monday last week, this message landed on my lap and it said, you know, when your reason, your reason for going up the tower, up the, up the tour, up the tour to the tower was to retrieve William Whiting's soul. Mm. Yeah. Like, oh my God. And then I realized, you know, when people lose their lives suddenly through violence, things like that, very often they're landlocked. Yeah. Their I soul think I... is trapped there in that pain. Yeah, no, I think that we should give some context for everyone listening. So it's really interesting. Um, I um I believe I don't know if his name is William Whiting or Richard. I thought it was Richard Whiting, but I think it's so interesting. Richard Whiting. Richard it is Richard Whiting. Whiting. Um, so it's interesting because I can just say for myself. Um, you know, I was in Glastonbury, it was actually almost a year ago. And when I got to the top of the tour, there was a tiny little thing, like it was, you know, an old piece of writing that was, you know, it just said that somebody was hung at the top of the tour. It was an abbot. And I didn't know, like, I had no context for it. And I was like, this is so strange, but it was weird because I was guided to show there was a woman who was up there with me hey, look at this. And she grabbed my arm because she was like, oh my God, she'd had a dream the night before of someone being like someone hung. And it was like one of those things that it really terrified her. She didn't know what it was about, but really it was a dream about this abbot. And I didn't, you know, it was interesting. I went through a series of like, then I got into like detective like mode. And I was like, who was this abbot? What happened? And I didn't realize till I, you know, I actually went to the Abbey that you're talking about that he was the man, like basically he stood up 
you know, to King Henry VIII and refused to submit, you know, when King Henry said that I want to break, I want to break from like the main church because I want to have a divorce. And I thought that it was amazing that Richard Whiting basically said, I will not bow before a tyrant. I serve God, you know, like I serve God and I'm not going to bend, you know, like, um, just be, you know, just because you, the King will it, you know, I, I do not serve you. I serve something greater. <clears throat> yeah. Many yeah. people would not have done that. They would have, especially before Henry VIII, who was brutal. Um, and uh, so what ended up happening um, is uh, somehow he was convicted of something that he didn't do. And they took him to the top of Glastonbury Tor and they hung right. him. Yes. And so for the people of Glastonbury, this is, it is, it is still today, I think, in the psyche, something that is deeply upsetting. And I think it's amazing that like, so for, for everyone listening, it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, when and I have a mutual friend, Emer Stassen, that's actually how we met. And when Emer Stassen, she did a beautiful summit uh, in October of last year, which was um, the witches reclaiming the round table. And when and I were the only two people who brought up Richard Whiting in our interviews. And the weirdest thing is she interviewed both of us on the same day. So it was real. It was clearly something that was like meant to come through. And that's why I was so excited for us to connect in this space. So now I know I've given, I've given contacts, but you know, when I'm, I want to definitely like have everyone know about your experiences. Yeah. So what happened was, as you say, but then Henry VIII signed a a law that allowed him to demolish the monasteries because he wanted to get rid of all this Catholic business and establish England as Church of England and himself as head of Church of England. So the demolition of the monasteries was brutal, absolutely brutal. And Glastonbury, which was the biggest diocese in England, held out until the very last minute until the soldiers arrived in force, intending on business. And they slaughtered anyone who stood still. Most of the priests escaped. Any of them that didn't got slaughtered. They demolished the abbey. And because Richard Whiting stood up to them, they charged him of treason and they dragged him to the top of the tour and they hung him. And it's quite a climb, I need to tell you. They then brought his body down into the village and where St. John's Church of England is now, they chopped him up into bits. So on Tuesday, after this message about retrieving Richard's soul, then came the message, now you're to put him back together again. So here was Isis and Asara's story. Mm-hmm. And so because I have done a lot of work, earth healing work and space clearing and all of that, and I used to do quite a lot of work in Australia with suicide. And I was given this technique where you put a sheet on the ground, you'd call in the angels of the four directions, you'd call in Archangel Sandalforth and anchors it to the earth to release him, you call in Metatron above to receive him. Mm. So I went in and I put his whole body together, all the bits of him together on this cloth. And then I placed his soul back in his heart. So yeah, so you, so this just happened. This just happened? Yes. Uh, that's what I'm saying is this is amazing. Um, this is amazing because um, for anyone listening, it's interesting because I thought of Wynn when I just did the, you know, Eden Owl and the Holy Grail Summit, I'd actually thought of reaching out to Win, and it was something that just like, it popped out of my mind. And I was like, and, and then, you know, we actually connected during the summit and uh, that was kind of the, that was the inspiration for this conversation today. But it seems mm-hmm. like it was all divine timing because you just received the message to put his soul, you know, to put the pieces back together, to bring his soul back. Yeah. So like, I just feel like so this- he the stand. Yeah. yeah. So he stand. So it was just amazing. And I thought, oh my God, I was very emotional. Last week was such an emotional week for me. And, um, and then yesterday I went to have a sound healing done, Elizabeth. And I was on the table and it was this lady who does this most amazing, amazing work. I had loads of sound healing done before, but not like this. It was like these dishes, these bowls, and she lays them on you and she plays them. And she said, you know, when I'm working on you, it's your body that's making the sound, not me. 
Mm. And the sign was so divine. And she said, oh, I have to stop when because I've just had somebody come in the room. And I went, oh. And she said, Phew, I've just had this knight in shining armor come and stand at my right shoulder. And right behind him, all the way behind him, are seven of those knights. And they are here to protect you. Mm. They're protecting you. I went, oh my God. And then I was thinking, what nights could they be? Because, you know, I do a lot of history work. And, and then this morning, I got an email from her and she'd gone into Zoom or whatever and done this research. And she sent me this picture of this knight, just as she described him in the, um, in the shining armor over the nail, the nail chain with the strip down his nose and on his helmet. And she said, Wayne, I just want to tell you that these knights are the knights of the round table. I love that. The, the <laughs> knights of King Arthur. The knights of King Arthur. Yeah. I just love that. No, because it just seems like you're definitely wound into this, like into this historical like thread because the fact that you were guided like you said, to go make the essence, the Arthur essence, the fact that you were the one that was called to like, you know, basically you said like, you know, get like Richard Whiting's soul and put it back. You know, like, I just feel like, th I think the land itself, they, it truly sees you, it's protecting you. And it's like, you are part of this mystery now. That's just so beautiful. Yeah. And I never know, you know, Elizabeth, I never know what I'm doing. I never know what I'm going to be asked to do. And sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing until it's over and then it lands. I'm just a very willing soul that just does as I'm asked and just a willing volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Just, just do. So I, I just, this, just this higher guidance and this information just comes in and I receive it and I listen to it and I comply. Yes, absolutely. So I'm just curious for anyone listening. So like, I, I really feel like the story of Richard Whiting is such a powerful one because I think, you know, especially like, you know, there have been so many people throughout history who they did not stand up, you know, like, and this is a man who was like, no, like, and I, I feel like I'm just curious now that you said that, like within the last week, you know, you, you know, did this, you did the sacred right restoring his soul do you feel like there will be an energetic repercussion? What do you feel like the significance of this was? Yes. Well, you know, I spoke to one of my girlfriends. It's a bit difficult, you know, who you speak to here because very close minds here. And I spoke to her about it. And I said, you know, it's nine months now. And she went, oh, my God, wait, nine months. That's how long it takes to birth. Yes. Nine months. Oh, my God. That's so powerful. Oh and of God. course, nine is the closure number. It's closure. And, you know, <clears throat> I just feel so honored that I have been chosen to do this for him. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because I just feel like his legacy is one. I mean, it's it's tragic in, in, in a way, but I also feel like it's very inspiring because I just I think that I think that like one mm -hmm. of the things I feel about Arthur is that he's this great force for good. And so I feel like anyone who follows the way of Arthur, it's like, you're a force for good, no matter what, it doesn't matter what comes at you. You are, you do not waver in your purpose. You don't waver in your faith. No. no, no. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is in front of this, this beautiful church of England now on that, on that site. And I've always been on that site a long time. And in front of the church is railings and seats and that space has always attracted mental health people and people with drug addiction and alcohol and it's very unsettled and there's constantly squabbles and fights there and very often the police have to come in and it's right beside where I stay and when I went back in April there was hardly any oh, and, when, and when my girlfriend went last week there was hardly any of that and I expect now that that will just disperse because that was the energy of violence that was attracting those people there. I understand. So it's like one of those things because you said when you first got there, you couldn't even be in the Abbey because the sense of violence was so strong. Oh my yes. goodness. So I feel like I get what you're saying. It's almost like that energy that like that was left over from hundreds of years ago, people were still feeling it. They were still kind of acting it out in their own ways. Yes. But because of the sacred work that, you know, you just described and the sacred work that so many of us have been doing. 
it's just, I think it's such a relief. Like, again, like I, you know, just did like the summit, you know, all about Eden. And so really this is part to me of the return of Eden is yes. by clearing, you know, clearing these old energies and making way for the new. And so I just, I just love that because I think that it's a really important message. Like it's like, yes, we return to Eden through like really for me, it's like that kind of Eden consciousness, but it's actual like 3d things we do in the world too. Like, you know, like this thing that you did, this sacred, it was like, I think you said it's like a soul retrieval and then release. It just feels like those are sacred actions that we can take. And those sacred actions are restoring our world, creating Eden here on earth. So yes. like, I just feel like, I think that what's amazing is you got to be an emissary of the divine creating that heaven on earth. And it just seems like all of us have, we all get called in different ways to do that. So I just think that your story is so powerful and so beautiful such a beautiful story really and you know to be part of that and you know it just happens and I just do it and um I you know I don't go out looking for that although I think in another way I do because I'm very engaged yes. in that in that energy in that whole and the whole deep old Celtic druid energy as well I'm very engaged in that yeah, my soul's engaged in that you know yeah, no, this is actually a good segue because I, I know that, you know, when we, before we press record, you mentioned that you actually have like a lot of um, deep sac sacred knowledge of the Druids. And like you said, they were almost like cousins to the Essenes. And I, I really want to talk more about Avalon, but I just think it's really fascinating that like when we look at the Druids and the Essenes, there's this like sacred connection with the Holy Land, Jerusalem. I just, I'm curious, like you've had such a wealth of experiences and like, you know, education studying the Druids. Can you tell us a little bit more, um, whatever wants to come through about them? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Essenes and the Druids, they're both the setting groups, you know, and um, and the Essenes came to Glastonbury and the people from Glastonbury went to the Holy Land. So this constant interchange of knowledge. And while the Essenes were quite rigid and their knowledge was stored in scrolls and crystals, the Druids had a much more fluid wisdom. It was much more easily fluid and it was oral, an oral tradition. And they did use crystals to hold their wisdom as well. But they, the history was, you know, given from one generation to the next. Mm. And, um, and it's an old, old tradition. But the Druids at Glastonbury actually came from Ireland. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. And to Wales, to Anglesey and to Glastonbury. So that is really, really interesting. And um, so when, and of course, Jesus came to Glastonbury and it was part of his training. So this deep, deep, deep wisdom, this gnosis that's held in both communities, Jesus came. It was part of his remembering of who he was. Mm. Just the same as when he went to Egypt, you know. Yes. And, um, and so he came and there was this rich culture there for him. And um, so you had this whole mystical school of Druids set up in Glastonbury. And you know, Glastonbury and Avalon at that time, it was, it was flooded. It was water, it was a water environment. And you had these islands in the middle of this sort of inlay of water. And so where the abbey is now is, was an island. And then across the way was the island of the priestesses and the maidens and the high priestess that is so beautiful I, it's so amazing to try and think about the like the the place back in time like that because yeah. like that's the way that it's described in all the mists like yes. i was like all the myths all the mists like it just the, like the mists of avalon like these that's the mist of avalon. water yes 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 and the priestesses they, they came in as maidens from the you know appropriate families they were brought there to be trained they came a bit six or seven year old to be trained and they were trained by the priestesses under the strict rule of the high priestess mm. and then they had different stages of initiation you see we've lost that whole initiation process our our young boys go out and get drunk that's their initiation you know um the for the girls they came and they had this whole initiation process this whole learning process the learning of the mysteries the learning of how to heal um how to be a mystic all of that and and then gradually they would graduate into priestesses mm. now they didn't all stay 
within the school. Some of them then would get married off into the local kings because this was a way of disseminating the knowledge and the wisdom into the courts. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yes. No, it's, yes. Just, it's interesting because like we started today kind of talking about, you know, like you said, like Charles, like really being this, this kind of force for good and having that good Arthur energy. I just feel like there's something that's happening. We're, we're talking about bringing the spiritual wisdom, the spiritual traditions back into the world, you know, back into the world of politics, back into like the divine kingship. I feel like that's, what's been missing is for so long, we haven't had leadership. You know, we haven't had the leadership that was really sourced, you know, in that kind of spiritual truth sourced in what was good for all. So it really just seems like we at this moment, it's almost like we are, you know, entering into a new era where we're, we're returning to these old, or we can't, if we choose to, we can look at these old traditions like you're talking about with the Druids and recognize that we can bring this wisdom into these other sacred places. Yes, yes. And of course, when the priestesses graduated, their graduation was that they were sent off across the lake. They were sent off into the mist. Mm. Now you think about this. You think about the symbology of the mist where you get lost in life. And they were sent off. And they had to then, because they were taught about how to raise the mist so they could go out. So one of their tasks was to be able to raise the mist. Mm. And so they were sent out to um, into the world. And if they wanted to come back, they had to be strong enough to lift the mist so that they could get the boat back home to the to the um to the to the high priestess and to, to the um, mystical school yeah I love that because I mean I think one of the things like you know I'm very curious about just like the way that I want to use the word magic for lack of a better word but it's just like the way that we used to be able to connect with the elements because I think nowadays like we see that like in kind of like high fantasy movies and books but we don't like always feel like we can do that in real life and I just love, like, I know that in so many ancient traditions, like we could call the rains, you know, we, I feel like we had such a connection with the elements. And so I, I've never heard that before what you're describing with the mist. That sounds truly magical. Mm -hmm. And the mist, of course, is part of the water element, you know, yeah. and that was part of their training. And it's very much where I work as well. I work with that because we are the elements. We are earth, fire, water, and air. Mm -hmm. And our ether is here. This is our higher spiritual self. And we have to learn to manage that. And those elements are actually managed in inner earth by the inner earth God Pan. He manages the elementals. I'm wondering actually now, because I'm I I really like Pan, but I'm sure like maybe people who are listening don't know that much about him. Can you share? I mean, I think that like one of the things too is for people who are listening. How can they really start to, you know, take, you know, take these sacred, you know, teachings and like actually live them in their own lives now? Because is, is it like, would it be for them to connect with Pan? What, what would you think about that? Absolutely. You see so much of our lives, so much of our history has been hidden by Christianity. A lot of it has been banished and hidden. And God, Pan, of course, is seen as the devil. Yes, I know. <laughs> like, and they have depicted him as this horrible being with feathers and makeup, you know, and claws and, and all of that. But he's not. As we have the forces on Earth, we have also the forces of inner Earth that manage inner Earth, Mother Earth's energy. And he manages that by managing and holding the elementals together because the elementals get out of balance because of our thinking and our feeling and our actions but also the global actions of the world, which is very toxic at the moment. And so they, they go to war with each other and you will always find those two elements out and you ask, which is the dominant one? And you leave the dominant one alone. You bring the weak one up so that you create harmony and balance. Mm. And that's what we need to be doing with ourselves, you know, that's what we need. And this was ancient wisdom that in long times gone by, people understood that and they understood and asked, what part of me is out of balance? Mm. What part of me needs strengthening and needs to come back? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. So I'm just curious, um, in terms of Avalon, like and all these sacred things, like are there um, any significant lessons, you know, transmissions or soul wisdom that you've really received that you feel like 
the people listening, that there's something that like they can really, you know, take and start applying in their own lives. Yes, yes. I think that we live such awfully busy lives and we're out there and we're we're full of nonsense, really, you know, and we spend far too much time in technology and not enough time in nature. And I would say that the one thing I could say to you is reconnect to the divine feminine by reconnecting to Mother Earth and to nature and getting in touch with those elements and balancing them in us because nature actually really does heal us, you know. And when I go to class, you know, I just walk, I go to the chalice well and I sit by the well and I walk through the gardens and, and I sit by the, the well and it's flowing from, it comes from source all the way down onto that Piscopaisa formation. And, and it's just so, so amazing. And of course we have the, the air, the wind in our hair and the sun coming from the heavens. So we have earth, fire, water and air around us. You just need to learn to reconnect again to those elements and use them and balance to balance us to balance us and when we get out of balance you know instead of running out there to find somebody else to balance us we need to go back inside and spend time with ourselves spend time with nature and ask what is it what is it that's out of balance with me what is it mm. because our inner voice will tell us you know if we listen and if we'd yeah. ask, if we'd well, listen, we ask. I think what you're talking about, it really is kind of almost like taking full responsibility, you know, for, I, yeah. I think for our energy, for our energy. And I think really having that understanding of ourselves as elemental beings, because, yeah. you know, we might like go into sacred ceremony and call in all the elements. We might connect with like certain elementals in nature. But like you said, recognizing that we have all of those within us and that it's almost like we have to honor uh, you know, like every aspect within us, every element within us to really truly show up in our fullness, in our power in this lifetime. So I think that yes. is. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. And we've forgotten that. And, you know, the whole system, the whole medical system and the whole system of religion and all of those things, all those institutions, <clears throat> what they've done is they've taken us further and further away from our true selves. Yes, Absolutely. And we, you know, I don't know about in America, I presume America is not very much different, Elizabeth, but here, everyone just gives their power to the doctors and the medicine system and everybody else. And they come knocking on my door and say, fix me up. And, and then, you know, but they don't want to do the work. They want me to fix some oh, magical yeah, no, no, no. Trust me, the medical system is the same in America. And it's so interesting too, because I get into the practice, like, I try almost like to never go to the doctor if I can help it. And then when I go there, they ask me, like, you know, they ask you all those like really personal questions. And it's so interesting because I literally must sound like the most boring person on the planet because <laughs> they're like, is there anything unusual about you? No. no. And it's like, it's interesting because I definitely think that like, you know, I don't usually think much about like kind of like that witch wound. Like that's something that I don't really energetically engage with usually. But I, when I go to like the medical doctors, there's some kind of weird thing that happens where it's like, do not be weird at all. It's like, be so like, it's very interesting though, because there definitely is um, like what you're describing. It's almost like, because there is such um, in the medical world, there is really this like, dis um they've totally disassociated from these more natural forms of healing that were the primary forms of healing for millennia for thousands of years that it's almost like you come across as like you're threatening their system that's part of why it's also amazing the work that you do with all the flower essences because you're reclaiming it's like a different kind of health a different kind of wellness like and well-being so like, I'm also curious, this is actually a good moment. Like, I know that you are a sacred, you know, flower essence producer. Can you talk about the, the work that you do with these flower essences? Okay, right. Um, when I was a little girl, I spent my whole life with my head in the hedgerows. I learned nothing until I was 14, nothing. They thought I was educationally subnormal. And then all of a sudden I woke up and I did all my education in four years and went and trained as a registered nurse. And then, you know, I moved to live in England for 16 years and, and all of that. So I lost that connection to nature and I lost my friends, the flowers. And it was only when I was in Australia two and a half years, I had a massive crash and burn. 
I just had a total dismantling. And it was a very difficult time for me. I was very homesick and it was difficult. And after about two years of walking in the dark night of the soul, things started to change for me. And I, natural healing started to call me. Mm. And I did, I've got various diplomas and certificates, but it wasn't until oh, about, about 1996, I was on my way back to Perth from London and I picked up a Bach flower book. And I went, I'd never heard of flower essences before. And I spent the whole journey reading that. And when I walked in the door into my home, there was a leaflet advertising a Bach flower course at the local academy. So I went and that opened the door and I trained in Western Australia in the Living Essences in, with these amazing, amazing teachers. And that was the beginning. I just came back to life again. It just, whew, I came back together again. And the minute I started working with the flower essences, I started to connect to the land of Australia. I began to see its beauty and in came the indigenous elders and mm. they came in to connect with me and to work with me because I was working with the land and I was working with nature and I qualified. I did three years of training. I'm, I've been working with flower essences now for 30 years and I used flower essences with my clients. And when I had been in Australia for seven years, I left nursing and I opened my own practice. And I was so fortunate because I opened my practice with a holistic GP. His mm. name was Harris, Harris Singh was his name. And he, used acupuncture counseling and nutrition and biofeedback as well as gp methods but i had this amazing amazing being to work with and everything was fine you know life was going on from one one situation to the next and then one day i'd had an upset with one of my boys and i was sitting bawling one saturday night and this message came and it said when you know it's time to go home oh oh what Who's worse home, you know? And I had never intended to come back to Ireland. But because that program from the Indigenous elders had taught me to listen, and I knew the message was coming from them. Mm. And so I rang my sister and she said, well, I got the same message a few days ago. And so to tell you how much I trusted it, I rang a shipping company the next morning to see how much it would cost to get me back to Ireland. I put my apartment on the market <clears throat> two weeks later <clears throat> and it sold within a week. I bought my home now on spec and three months later I was here. But it was just a week before I came back that I got told you are to go back and make flower essences from your childhood friends. Oh my God, I love that. I love I know. that. I know and I got here and then I said you know I wanted to do some work and they went oh no lady you aren't doing that you need to anchor your etheric body to the earth and we'll tell you when you're ready to work I love that oh my god that's and it, I, so I used aromatherapy and reflexology and those other tools I had until one day I got the tap on the shoulder and it said when you can it was it was Easter you can start at the summer solstice and that was 2017. I think and, that's so amazing because I think a lot of people, they just want to go and do it. But you're saying that it's like, no, we really have to get reconnected to the land. The land. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is where my etheric body was connected. This is where I was born, where my, your, your etheric body is connected to where you're born. So anyway, um, that was it. I started and, um, and then, you know, to create essences here is so barbaric and third world and, you know, in a way that, not third word way, but just so difficult because I had to go through environmental health to get permission to, and go through their program and comply with their rules. And after I had just about finished a year of that, of absolute hell, um, I got a letter from them saying, dear Mrs. Tyree, we are sorry to tell you that we cannot possibly accept you. There is nothing in this, nothing in this here, except water and brandy oh my god oh my god and i went of course they're essences they're vibration and they went 
Oh no, Mrs. Terry, we don't deal with vibration. <laughs> and then I'm sitting in tears. I'm saying, what are you doing bringing me back here? And now this <laughs> And then all of a sudden in came the information that you to use them into the aura, that these essences are meant to be not taken orally, but sprayed through the subtle bodies. Mm. where is where they work in the first place that is amazing so i'm just curious for people who are listening so i'm i'm not sure all the indigenous uh flora and fauna of ireland but say something like a rose like how how was how would that kind of be in the aura yes well let me just explain a little bit more the flower essence of our nature's most subtle product mm. so you have the plant that you eat and you grow in the garden you can make homeopathy out of it. You can collect the flower, the essential oils out of it at certain times. But the actual essence themselves, there is no product in in the in the in the actual in the actual medicine. It is the vibration of the medicine, and the vibration of the medicine is the astral body of the plant that only exists for the time that the plant is in flower. That's all. Mm. And so I came home, Elizabeth, and I thought, oh, I don't even know how to do this because it was really strict. You weren't, you know, you bought the essences of that our teachers made and we used them. I'd never made essences. And so I looked up the book and I started using the box system of cutting the flowers, putting them in water, leaving them in the sun and having the transfer of the energy to the water and then blending it with brandy. Until one day I was driving over this mountain and the spirit comes in and said, will you stop that crap? Will stop it now? That's not how you work at all. And they showed me about how to bring my whole self up into a bubble, all my energy, all my consciousness into a bubble and to approach the plant, asking permission from the diva of the land and mm -hmm. asking permission from the plant. And then absorbing that body into the bubble and placing it in the carrier. Oh my God, wow, that is amazing. And it is, and, and then, you know, I'd no sooner done that, and they said, well, now you can make tree essences, <clears throat> and you can make tree essences for the children, because our subtle bodies develop at certain ages, and children don't have an astral body. They just have a physical body, and then an etheric body, and they don't develop an astral body until 14. And so this whole new learning came in for me because I'd studied Steiner when I was in Australia. And so the whole Steiner system came in for me. And so now when I go to Glastonbury, I have the Glastonbury essences, I have the maiden essence. And the maiden is for when we start out on our spiritual journey, whatever age we are. Mm. Then I had the high priestess, the lady of the lake, the high priestess. I had the chalice well. I had the holy thorn. You know, when Joseph of Arimathea put the stick in the ground in Glastonbury and it grew into a thorn. So yeah. this thorn, there are thorn bushes in Glastonbury that are taken from that original tree. And um, what else have I got? I've got the Merlin. The Merlin. Yeah, the Merlin. Oh, that's so, I'd love to hear about the Merlin. I'm very deeply connected with Merlin. So is yes. this... And then, of course, there was the, the Mary Magdalene, because Magdalene, Glastonbury has a huge connection to Magdalene. And in Glastonbury Abbey, when the Abbey was burned down way back, what, 1100, 1200, um, it was burned down because originally they were made of wood. And then when they rebuilt it, the first part that they built on the original old grounds of the first little church was dedicated. It's called the Ladies' Chapel. And, you know, they try and tell you, you know, it's, it's Mother Mary, you know, it's not, it's Magdalene. <laughs> it's Magdalene's chapel, because when Magdalene came to France, she had huge influence all over Europe. <clears throat> and the universities of Oxford and Cambridge had whole sections dedicated to her, whole sections of learning dedicated to her. And so she was so well known and so honored. And that chapel is dedicated to her. That is so beautiful because I think a lot of people, they think that like when she went to France, like it was almost like an exile and she like lived the rest of her life, like almost like, you know, weeping. So it's amazing that you're describing a very different story, which is one that like her wisdom was revered. I just, oh, yes. 
<clears throat> and she had her own gospel, you know, which wasn't discovered until quite recently, or, you know. And when they find like the Nanamani skulls, when they found that a lot of her gospel had been torn and disintegrated. <clears throat> but she was absolutely revered all through Europe. And of course, she holds the mesenteric line. She holds the bloodline of the Holy Grail. It's her that holds that. Yeah, that's actually one of my other questions for you is I, I feel like I ask this to everyone now, but like, you know, what does the Holy Grail mean to you? So you do you see the Holy Grail as the, the Magdalene bloodline? Just curious. Yes. That's how you see the Yes, bloodline. the Magdalene bloodline. But also for me, the Grail is the God of my heart. It's the essence. My soul essence is the Grail <clears throat> that has grown over many, 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 many lifetimes, gradually growing in wisdom falling down and picking itself up again and growing and expanding. So that's the grail within. We are the grail. We are the grail. We hold the bloodline and we hold the wisdom and we hold the spiritual world as it manifests on earth. And of course, Mother Earth, Gia, she is a goddess. She is a spiritual divine being, which we forget. And, and, you know, this whole disenfranchment from the divine feminine and the goddess has allowed us to be disconnected from Mother Earth and disconnected mm -hmm. from our bodies. And then, of course, all of that religious crap that has put shame and guilt and all of that on our bodies and our physicality, where we can't actually honor that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the whole sin, the whole sin nonsense. To me, sin is when we lose our alignment with the great source. Yes. And that's what happened in Eden. What happened in Eden is that we lost our alignment. We brought in our own will, our own free will, our own, yeah. And, and we lost our connection. And, you know, that's what we're trying to regain now. And, um, yeah. That, yeah, that alignment, that alignment. Yeah. No, I love that. So I'm just curious. So for anyone listening, so for for alignment, you know, because I'm, I'm feeling like from what you've said today, one of the ways is like honoring all the elements within ourselves is a way of coming back into that alignment, coming <laughs> back into connection with nature. Are there other ways that you think that people can really come into um, full alignment? Because I think that a lot of people, they, they're always looking outside of themselves for like, like they're trying to arrive. Like if I get to this certain point in my life, then I'll feel good. And really it's all about the alignment now. And so I'm wondering if there's any wisdom that you can share um, more about this energy of alignment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's a coming to understand that everything that is, is in us. Everything that is, since the world actually was created, is right in our cells, in our DNA. It's there. And everything that exists in the heavens, in the great cosmos, is right there in our soul. And when our soul lands, when it anchors itself into our heart, it then migrates into the nucleus of every single cell in our body. So we are the embodiment of the cosmos as well as the embodiment of Earth. Mm, and so we can align by connecting to the star systems, the sun and the moon and their cycles. It's about the cycles of life. The Earth has its cycles. We women have our cycles. Um, the stars have their cycles that they move in. And the more we align with that, the more we will come and we will realize that we are just one little part of consciousness, just one little speck in the whole range of consciousness that exists in the universe. Mm, that was so beautifully said. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious. I have a couple last minute questions, but the one that kind of popped up, you said something about the etheric body being connected to the place you were born. I've never heard that before. I'm just curious because I do feel that I think that we kind of take some of the characteristics and the energy of the place that we grew up, the place that we come from. I'm wondering, is that, is that connected to the etheric body? Like the way that you're describing it? I would love to hear more because I've never heard this before. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Okay. Hmm. We are made up of subtle bodies and the etheric body is this silver. Now, if you look at somebody off, so off focus, you'll see this little silver lining of light around them. That's your etheric body. And it's the template that your physical body is built on. Okay. Now, when I went to write my ancestral alchemy healing, I knew that our soul retrieves what it needs from our body and goes back 
for whatever source it needs to be at. I knew our physical body returns to the minerals, but I didn't know what happened to our etheric body. And then I find if I ask, I'm shown and I'm told, it's just as simple as that, it lands. And so here I got told the etheric body, when it's not attached to our physical body, actually lives inside the earth, mm. in a chamber for each family inside the earth. And so in our etheric body, everything that happens to us in this life is stored there. And anything that's unresolved, like all the crap that was on our lives that we don't deal with and put it away, it goes back and it goes down into this chamber. Also, the energetic imprints that we call the myosomes in homeopathy, these ways of thinking, feeling, acting, being in the world and seeing the world and relating to ourselves and others, those myosomes, those energetic imprints, they, when we pass over, they go down in that chamber as well. And they get sent when the soul decides it's coming in and sends a message to Mother Earth. And it says, I'm coming and I'm coming to gain mastery of these things this time. Then Mother Earth says, OK, down there, Queen Gadanda, let's have that. And that information from down there, because our physical form is a mirror image of our soul. And this material, which is the mirror image of the soul's karma, is sent to to the mother and it lands in the mother's sacred chakra before we're ever conceived and this is our etheric material that we're built out of that is beautiful i love that i just also love this idea like you said there's like a chamber with all of the wisdom oh my god that's incredible i just love that it's like mm. but it's not necessarily the wisdom because the wisdom gets taken with the soul this is the stuff that's unresolved this is uh. the stuff this is the gift that keeps on giving. This is the gift. And this is about the healing of this so that we can return to Eden. Mm, yes, this is right. about, yeah, because as people, we're becoming more and more and more and more and more out of alignment. We're creating more and more and more dysfunction, more and more and more disharmony and becoming more and more separated and sad and lonely and whatever. So it's time, it's now time for this to stop. It's now time to have a huge cleanse and to do this. Now in past times, when this happened in past times, the great cosmos said, right, I've had enough of that. And she just brings a deluge. Like yes, I know the flood. <laughs> yes. I Atlantis and Lemuria just got flooded and she just took us all out. And she said, oh, let's start again. You're a waste of time, you are. And so this time it's about, let's not go there let's find a way of actually restoring this harmony and this alignment within ourselves so we can come back to this Eden. We haven't progressed this far to fall again. This is the, all the time we fail in Eden. We've been coming to a certain point in consciousness and then falling again, point and falling again. Yes, absolutely. So one thing I, I just feel like I just, I love so much of what you're saying. It's so beautiful. Um, but I actually, um, you know, wanted to just ask you a couple more questions about the plants. Cause I just feel like that's part of your sacred medicine. So I'm wondering, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the three things that come to mind for me. Um, you mentioned the Oak tree. Uh, I also, when I was in Avalon, I felt a big connection with the Hawthorne tree. And, um, I, again, I love in the rose, I just love roses. So I'm wondering if you can talk about those three or, or any other extra ones that want to come in, but I just feel like those ones are really calling to me. Okay. So let's start with the oak tree and the oak tree is the symbol of the Druids, of course, and the ancient Celts. And from little oaks grow big trees, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's a very sacred tree in Druid and Celtic mythology. And here it is, was standing where I made the, the King Arthur essence. The second one was the, the thorn. And the thorn is very much seen as a Glastonbury sacred tree because from Joseph of Arimathea, when everything went wild in um, the Holy Land, Joseph of Arimathea brought quite a lot of the Essenes to Glastonbury. And the story goes that he was carrying a stick and he stuck the stick into the ground and the stick took root and grew a thorn tree. Mm. 
And so Glastonbury is known for the holy thorn. And there's lots of Glastonbury trees around where they've been grafted from the original tree. And then they're just grafted on and on. And it's the same descendants from that early time of that, um, that bloodline, that grail line coming here, mm. coming here to, to live and to share and to have a fresh beginning. So that's that one. And the rose, of course, the rose is the sacred divine feminine. Oh, okay. I was like, that's like my favorite flower. That's how I was like, I want to know about this one. So when you look at the rose, it represents the feminine genital. Hmm. And it's the budding and all the different stages of coming into the bud and the opening of the bud and the flowering of the bud and the falling of the bud. And it, it represents all our different stages of growing and being and leaving you know, mm. birthing. Do you have any, what are your favorite, because you work with these essences, what are your favorite essences to work with? Well, I work mostly with wild, the wildflowers mm. and because they haven't been manipulated and doctored, they hold the genuine, the genuine energy of the earth and the genuine energy of history and everything in it. So I don't know that I have a favorite, I don't. I I made two new ones recently. The last time I was in Glastonbury in the Abbey, I made from the um, Mongo Mongolia tree, the Mongolia tree, I made a grail essence. And then when I came back here this year, out of my own garden, <clears throat> I made um, a violet flame essence. Ooh, I just love this. It sounds so amazing. Yeah, and they are powerful. They're very powerful stuff. So, so, but they're just, it's just what do we need at this moment in time? And my essences <clears throat> are quite different from other essences because when I create the essence, I, I have this connection to the land and this connection to the flower and permission asked along the way. And I take a photograph that encapsulates that energy at that moment. Mm. And those photographs are carrying the vibration of that flower at that moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when people need a flower essence, I just hand them, I've got about 100 now, I hand them the cards and I say, you just go through the cards and your own inner soul will tell you which one you need. Mm. Your soul tells you. And so it's about your affinity to the flower. And then that's the essence you need to take for a month or so. Usually by next month, it'll have gone. It'll be something else. But it's a way of actually taking off the layers and just working with ourselves, just removing layer by layer by layer. And they're just, and they're simple and there's no contraindication. They can be taken with medication that's prescribed by, by the doctors. Um, there's no, nobody, whether you're a child, an elderly person or sick or whatever, there's no contraindications. They're just pure loving energy a combination and my my essences are a lot of them i've got the names of the stars the solar system essence have the names of the stars and the moons so that this combination of heaven and earth in in a tiny little bottle this combination of energy of heaven and earth together just to bring us wholeness yes oh my god i love that I love, especially someone like me, like I'm all about bringing heaven down to earth. And I love that they're just together in these bottles. Like, oh my God. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to send you some Elizabeth. I'm, going to I'm so excited stuff. for this. I'm very, very excited. Um, I actually, okay. So I know that we've been talking for a little while, but I wanted to just ask maybe the one more question. And I know that like something you said in one of the emails to me, um, you said, you know, we we're talking about Ireland and you said like, you know, sad things that Ireland has a deep, rich history that is just hidden below the topsoil. And you said that you were digging deep to bring it back into the light. So I'm wondering if you can really talk, I just feel like you're doing such sacred work with the earth. So I'm just wondering if you could share a, a little bit more about this. And this is so fascinating. Yes, well, you know, now that I'm back, when I first came back, it was such a, I found myself in a barren land. I found myself with people that didn't speak my language, who didn't have, the understanding that I had, you know, I'd lived in this very free society in Australia. And here I come back into sort of very fundamentalist religions and governments and all of that. And I felt lost. But, <clears throat> but now that I'm through my work, I'm connecting with other beautiful people. But when I got told to come back, I got told to come back, first of all, to help to establish fifth dimension here on earth. Mm. to lift humanity, to help, to be part of lifting humanity up. 
so that we can progress to the next level of a being to fifth dimension and fifth dimension is the throat chakra and it's all about authenticity and truth and transparency mm. and using our voice to speak with love and compassion but with truth and um the second reason that i got told to come back was to connect to the ancestors which i am now because i've just wrote this ancestral healing too and the third reason was to reconnect to the goddess energy to the divine feminine and to be part of restoring the divine feminine mm, that is so and you know and i suppose i look back on my time in Australia. And it was a great place to be because I had access to so much ancient wisdom and all the Eastern religions, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, theosophy, ancient Aboriginal um, healing and philosophy. And it, I just drank it for breakfast, morning, noon and night, you know, I just fed on it. And, and I just grew and expanded and expanded and expanded. And I didn't realize how much I actually knew until I came back. Mm. And, um, and I'm back here to share that journey. You know, it, it's a journey that I had to put a lot of effort into. It just didn't land. But now it just lands now. Now I've reached that sort of, you reach a pinnacle and you reach a point where you've actually sort of broken through a surface and there it is, it's available to you. And now when I need to know things, I just ask and it lands almost immediately. Yeah. almost immediately so yeah i actually you're having me to ask another quick question because one thing that's like really striking me about our conversation i have i have this too is um you get like constant like kind of messages and they're coming yeah. through and you're like oh and then you have to you you're like okay i guess i gotta do this now um for people who are not like they're they're not fully open yet like their channel isn't as open do you have any things that you would recommend so that they can start getting these messages and they can start being in the same kind of alignment with spirit? Yes. I think that, first of all, you know, free yourself up a bit from the dogma that you're carrying around. It isn't all the truth. Please understand that we've been programmed. We have been programmed with a program that isn't for our convenience, but it's, you know, like we're living here in Europe, we're all living out of the Roman Empire. It's still here. It's still controlling us. It's still got power over us. You know, come back and reclaim your power. Ask and, and go out there and educate yourself. Change who you are. Be like, you know, I come here and I, I say to people, you know, oh, you know, they were, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. And what I see in them, because we've had inquisition here, what I see in them is I see, I see their, their cell memory just step up and their soul step up. Oh, no, 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 no. And, and people are so scared. And say, you're okay, you're safe now, you know, you can, you can ask. So I think people need to get out of apathy. They out of, need apathy. To, out mm -hmm. of apathy. They need to connect to themselves. They need to know that everything that ever was is right inside them. They need to make space, listen to less television, have less sort of technology intervention, have more nature intervention be with nature hug trees talk to the flowers um and give yourself some time to be by yourself most people cannot be by themselves and for this sort of thing to land you have to be willing to listen so start developing the inner skills of listening inner listening and inner seeing and mm -hmm. and you know being able to channel down through your crown and it takes time and it takes dedication and you know, for me, I'm still in process of doing that. When I started out, I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't see anything. Then I began to hear and I couldn't see, but I could feel. And, I, you know, so we all developed through different senses. But, you know, that you're not mad that those, those messages are given for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're given from a higher source. And, and they're there for you to guide you and protect you and open you up and to bring you back into alignment, to bring you back into ascension, bring you back into Eden. Yes. I mean, I also feel like, especially you have, like you said, like the knights in shining armor coming to you just <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> no, but I love that. I know, but I think that was such a beautiful answer. Um, I also, 
I had like, I had another question that popped. Oh, I got it. I was like, it popped in. And then I, then I got so, I was just literally mesmerized by everything you were saying. I was like so mesmerized, but no, one thing that I'm really curious about is um, you mentioned, you know, this kind of energy of the Roman empire. And I think this is really interesting because I know that at one point Rome had power over England, but I didn't think oh. about the, yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's um, one of the big things actually, um, around the time of King Arthur, that was part of why it was so crazy was because Rome pulled out and then they lost like all sense of order. And there were all these warring tribes. And that's when Arthur stepped up to unite the warring factions. So it's, so Rome has, so that, anyway, so I'm just curious when you say that there's still this energy of the Roman empire, um, what energies in, in particular are you talking about? Because I think if people can kind of know the energies that are kind of subtly in the background that they don't even realize they're they're still experiencing, then maybe we'll be able to come into like that kind of deeper place within. Well, they're not that subtle, Elizabeth, at all. So they're not. And it it came in through the Roman Christian Church. Mm. That's where it came in through. And that was all about control. And it wasn't about the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus were bastardized mm. and manipulated for the benefit of the Roman Empire, because it was beginning to fall. And so this whole Christian movement stuff was a really good tool for them. And, and it's all about control and money and finances and, and all of that. And so that whole, and it's got such a deep root in us now that, you know, we have to have the courage to pick it up and weed it out and, and, and be free, be free. You know, I, I think it's been prophesied that all of the religions of the world will fall and we will come into a space of spirituality, into that space of true, true understanding of who we are and who the great creator source is and the different levels of the source. And, um, and that, you know, we are powerful, but we've given that power away and we've been controlled by that. And people don't question and they don't, they don't listen. And, and they're too frightened. They're too frightened to do that. And, um, I suppose coming back to Ireland, Australia was very free of that. They didn't give a hoot about any of those things. Um, coming back here, and I went, oh, Jesus, look at it, you know, see it. And I see how societies are all just controlled. Whole societies just controlled by this. Yeah. And it's, a, it, and it's about power. And, you know, one of the things in the world that we have as humanity have managed very poorly is power. Yes, power actually. is the making of us and the breaking of us. And, and it's not about power over. It's about power in ourselves, a power to get into alignment, to be in alignment, to draw down what we need from source. And that whole power business, you know, if you look, go back to the position where, uh, you know, the divine feminine was put to death through the position and all sorts of excuses, that was power over the feminine. And they did such a good job that we would never come back again. And it's taken, what, five, six hundred years for us to sort of begin to sort of lift our heads again. So that power, you see it in the diminished um, recognition of the divine feminine. You see the power there. Mm. And if you look in the Christian churches, you still have that, that process of its male supremacy male supremacy and you see it in businesses and although women in businesses are beginning to you know exercise their power and get themselves educated and exercise the power in business and you know but they still have a greater fight to have equal pay and have equal opportunities in work and all of that you know mm, yeah well it's interesting as you were talking I appreciate everything you said well, like, two things that kind of popped up for me um, I was actually thinking of like two sacred masculine, you know, that we like presence here is uh, one is like Richard Whiting. You were talking about like people are too afraid to stand up. And I was like, oh, but he did it. Like he wasn't afraid. No. And so I thought it was amazing that he's a sacred masculine. And then I also thought it was interesting because you had two um, bottles of the Arthur essence, which was for courage. And so I just think it's so interesting what you said, like people are, too, you know, they were too afraid to stand up. And I think it's amazing that two of the great, like, you know, divine masculine presences that we've talked about today, Arthur and Richard Whiting, those were two sacred masculine energies who stood in their courage. And yes. I just think that's definitely 
I don't know. I think that's a thread that's tying everything together. And also again, bringing back, you know, everything to the Knights, the round table that can't like, I, I think that there is, I feel like there's like a sacred stewardship that is, it might be on the inner planes now, but it's, I feel like we are awakening to it. We are remembering it. And I feel like that's how we're getting to stand up once again. On Sunday, I went to a shamanic um, training day and it was an introduction to the dragons. Ooh, the dragons! Oh, I'm sorry. I, I love that. Continue. I love dragons. And <laughs> and it was women because many many times you go to these sort of um, sort of sacred stuff. It's all it's all women. But there was two men there and one guy was in his 70s and another guy, probably late 30s, no, 40, about 40. And oh my God, this sacred masculine and they just oozed it and you just wanted to be in their company and hug them and hold them and drink of it. That beautiful, beautiful energy of the sacred masculine. When this, when the masculine comes out of its toxic state and comes into its sacred state, into its beautiful divine masculine, divine God space, it is so, so beautiful. Yes. It is so, so, and, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore that you know, um, and as I said before, it's not about bringing that toxic masculine down. It's about bringing that divine feminine up. So we get equality and we get the sacred marriage and we have that within us. Because within us, we have the masculine and the feminine and we need to bring it strong within us so that we can use both of them when we need them, you know? And uh, so this is our future. This is our, our journey, you know, to build up our feminine, get it strong, have it in action so that we can um, bring that balance back into the world. Mm. And then it is about holding it because you have the turn of the cycle. And so, you know, we've been there before when we've become toxic. And this time it's about us, when we reach that pivot of here, to hold that and expand and grow in that, in that divine wisdom of the divine sacred marriage. Mm. Beautiful. So um, I know we've been talking for a while, so I only want to ask you, I think like one more question. And so um, I guess my last question is, you know, why do you believe it's so important for us to, you know, connect with Avalon in today's world? It seems like it's been very important for you. And so I'm just curious what you think. Yes. Well, it's very important for me. I suppose for other people, perhaps they have sacred places that are their calling. But I think for me, you know, I know that I've lived many, many lives and Avalon and Glastonbury it's in me it's you know I'm the priestess and I, I know that um, around um, sacred sites in Ireland that I have been a druid priestess and um, in times have lost my life to that um, and for me I suppose I suppose it's part of my continuing awakening into who I fully am and we journey in time to pick up pieces of our soul that we have lived before. And, and we're bringing these fragments of our souls back together. Mm. And, and for me, Glastonbury, with all that it holds, with this divine wisdom, is something that I need to do in this life, like in connecting to the ancestors, connecting to the ancient wisdom that they hold connecting to places like Glastonbury is part of my my sole mission it's a part of remembering beautiful thank you I mean I think that was just perfect I love that you know for for what you're describing it's really about just we're remembering because I feel like everyone here it's like we've we've done this before We've done this before. And so really it is just coming to that sacred remembrance that we've been trained in different past lifetimes. Like you said, like you were, you know, Druid priestess in Ireland, you were an Avalonian priestess. It's really just like bringing all of that knowledge, that soul knowledge back online and, um, and just like bringing all those parts of our souls together again. That just, that sounds very beautiful. Yeah. We're bringing them together to move to the next step of evolution. Yes. I love that. And I love that too, because sometimes like if we have like a tragic lifetime, um, it's just, it's amazing because it wasn't for, it wasn't for naught because actually we're using that sacred wisdom from that lifetime. And it actually is helping us here now. It is. So that is really beautiful. Yeah. 
Um, but so, yes, um, I was wondering before we um, close, is there anything else that you would like to talk about? Anything else that you feel called to share today? Yeah, I'd like to share about a course that I've written and it's yes. called the Ancestral Alchemy Healing. And do you like it? The tree and the DNA and the roots? It is so be Oh my God. I think it's amazing. That's amazing. And this, this course, uh, this healing works back through seven generations and all of their descendants and all of their descendants and all of their descendants. And we work through the mother and father's family tree to remove the miasms and the unresolved issues that we have placed in that chamber down there and to release it from around our etheric bodies and into our cells and into our DNA and our, our cell memory so that we can clear the slate and we can once again be pure and be who we were in Eden. Mm, I love that. Un unashamed of our own beauty and in the presence of our own beauty and in the presence of the creative forces of all that is. And so this is what this is. So this was created last January. It's been taught through Ireland for the last 15 months. I now have teachers on board that are helping me to teach it. And this year we're going international. That's so and I would love to say to the viewers here, I'm here. I will come to you or you can come to me. I, it was given to me by my mother before she passed. And she has said to me, this is my gift to the world. This is my gift to humanity. This is my gift to the world. And I know in my heart that this is the most powerful thing. I'm 30 years now as a practitioner. I'm 72 years of old, old. And I know that in all my life, that this is the most powerful thing I've been asked to do, Elizabeth. And I have a responsibility to do it and to bring it where I can. Absolutely. So yeah, so if people are interested in learning more, they should they go to your website? How should yeah. they? Okay, go to your they website. Can go to my website and then I can connect with them and we can go further from there. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Okay. And um and I'm just, gonna and just and just refer back to this conversation now so that I know where they've come from. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. And also I know on your website, you have many flower essences. So I'm just like, just very much encouraging anyone who is listening, go to the website, you know, look at the flower essences. If you're curious about the ancestral alchemy healing, um, this, like you said, this is like the most powerful thing you've been called to create. So if you're curious, like just reach out to Wynne, she'll give you more information. Um, but yes, thank you. When it's been such an honor to be with you here today. I have loved, you brought through so much wisdom. I'm just so deeply grateful to you. It's been just... <laughs> Thank you. It's been so lovely to connect, Elizabeth, you know, because when I listened to your summit, you put together links of the chain that were missing for me. Yes. So thank yeah. you for that. Thank you so much for that. That was my pleasure. I mean, I was called to, I was very much called to put that together and I was called to, to bring you into this, uh, this new sacred space. Um, you know, I just, I don't know what it was, but like I said, I, I thought of you for that summit, but it's almost like it was supposed to be now because you just had that experience, the soul retrieval for Richard Whiting. And I just really want to, before we close, I just really want to bring like almost, I don't know why I'm called through this, but almost like a moment of silence um, for everyone listening, um, just like deep reverence and respect to honor this great soul who stood up, you know, to authority for the greater good. And um, I think by taking that moment of honoring, uh, honoring his soul, I feel like we also provide healing. Uh, we provide healing. And again, this is again, part of our restoration of Eden. Uh, so I'm just so grateful to you and for being here and uh, for bringing through this last piece of the story. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.